We made this. Hello, everyone. This is Tony, Network Chief of We Made This. As you know, our podcast network brings together a brilliant assortment of talent who talk about all kinds of pop culture content, such as the episode you just listened to, or maybe you're just about to listen to. We're not going anywhere, but we'd love to keep the lights on for even longer if you're able to support our network on Patreon. For just £2 a month, you get your name in lights and the satisfaction of knowing you're helping us produce more great audio. And for £3 a month, you'll get your name in lights, but you'll also get access to an exclusive bi-monthly podcast from the We Made This Talent Pool on podcasting, pop culture, and, well, you tell us. We'll take your suggestions. For less than the price of a coffee per month, you can help keep We Made This going. Just head to patreon.com forward slash we made this. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash we made this and get the ball rolling. Now, back to your scheduled programming. Hey guys, welcome to Gotham University, the podcast where we discuss all things Batman related kind of exhausted today i'm not gonna lie you guys a uh, big big episode here jason melendez here michael slammer over in yonder's over there I'm and over here. i want to thank everybody for listening right now wherever you are tuning in whether it's on spotify amazon or apple or any other platform for that matter thank you so much and thank you for tuning in on a uh, instagram and twitter on gotham U pod please if you haven't done so tell your friends tell your family tell your fellow nerds that's where we are that's what we're posting how are you mike it is a big big day it is a big day it's been a long day man i i worked all day and then i then i just watched tv all day <laughs> mm. there was something there was a movie that came out I think at like three o'clock in the morning, Eastern Standard Time. Yeah. And uh, I, I got to tell you, I, I was I was working. I logged on this morning and I was talking to my colleagues. And I was like, hey, guys, you know, like, do we have a busy day? Do we, you know, can you make sure to not give me any work today? Because I got stuff to do. <laughs> but I sat down. I watched the Zack Snyder cut of the Justice League. And man, I won't lie to you. I had to take a couple of breaks. Sir. This has been years and making four years to be exact. That is a presidential run right there. That is an Olympic run right there. Four years of hashtags, of petitioning, of campaigning, and it finally came to a head, like you said, this past this morning at 3.01 a.m. to be exact. Ooh. And as promised a couple of weeks ago in our last episode, I said I would stay up and watch Man of Steel. Then I would follow up with Batman v Superman, and then that would take me right into Justice League, and I have not slept much since I've done that. I can so. see the look of exhaustion on your face, and I am, I am like, I have secondhand exhaustion right now. We're recording this on video, so folks, you know, obviously you're audio only, but man, trust me when I say Jay went to bat and he did it for you. <laughs> I woke up. What day are we on? We're on Thursday. I woke up on we Wednesday on Thursday. <laughs> at 8 a.m., did my normal stuff, and then I decided before I got into the the Snyder-thon – actually, technically, this is part of the Snyder-thon – I wanted to watch Watchmen because okay. that is a Zack Snyder film. That is sure. also a DC film, and I wanted to kind Very of true. really dive into something that I haven't seen in quite a while that was an ensemble movie by Snyder, and – after that, that took me into Man of Steel, did two and a half hours of that, then took me into Batman v Superman, took me about three hours of that because I watched the alternate edition because the theatrical one is for pussies, and <laughs> took like a 20-minute break, grabbed my foods, grabbed my bathroom breaks, did all that stuff, and then just 3.01, hit the HBO Max again, and went right into Zack Snyder's film, and... Went to bed at 7.30, or, oh yeah, 7.30. Woke up at 9.30 just to do life all over again. So, yeah, I'm kind of a little bit wound up today. He's a little wound up. He's a little, a little wound bit. up. So I I did um, 
I had intended to do a little bit of a watchathon, but unfortunately, uh, life got the better of me on this one. So I did watch Batman Begins to kind of start like the more modern Batman story. And I kind of took it as like, well, you know, if this is his, you know, let's let's pretend that the Christian Bale Batman and the Ben Affleck Batman are one of the same for a second here, regardless of whether they are or aren't. Right. Like it's all it's all a story and it's all connected, intertwined. And we all know the history of the Batman and all this. But I thought it would be fun to start there. And uh, I had intended to watch Dark Knight and then following that with Man of Steel and then following Man of Steel with Batman v Superman and then ultimately landing here. So I didn't do all of that. Uh, so egg on my face. But let me ask you this, Jay. Let me ask you this. Was your watchathon worth it, in your opinion? I am going to put it like this. I thought I was nervous as all hell going into Zack Snyder's Justice League. Because all that movies, all those movies that I saw was very nostalgic because mm-hmm. I haven't seen Dawn of Justice really in a while. Not like in its entirety. I would see it in like breaks here and there, but never actually sit down and, you know, embrace the film itself mm-hmm. and really pick it apart piece by piece. Um, and then going into Zack Snyder's film, the Justice League film, I thought to myself, you know, what if this isn't as good as it was? Like, people want it to be. Like, what if this actually becomes a bomb? Like, what if this is not as well as we all had hoped it would? Because and I, for one, I've been cheerleading for this thing for four years now, saying that this was better. This will be better than what we got in 2017. And when it's all said and done, man... I could say that I needed a cigarette when I was done because Ooh. I felt very satisfied. I felt very <laughs> pleased with everything that I had put myself through as far as lack of sleep, a small diet because I did not want to take that many bathroom breaks. And yeah, it was just, it was totally worth it. Just worth the ride. The whole, the whole cinematic wow. experience was just perfect to say the least. I mean, were they all, were there flaws in it? Yes. But as far as experiencing this from movie one all the way to, you know, the end credits of the Justice League film, would not ask for more. Actually, I'm not lying. I, w- I am lying. I would ask for more. And that is more damn Snyder movies. All right. All right. More Snyder movies. Restore uh, the Snyder cut. Hashtag. It seems to me that most folks on the Twitters agree with you. Uh, folks, it, like like there has been generally resounding agreement that this was a good movie, even though it dragged on at some points. Uh, so you know, never mind your watchathon. Ha- scale one to ten. So now on on the We Made This Network, I also host We Are Starfleet, and as you know, our episode breakdowns, our overall impression. Right? What's your overall impression? Scale one to ten. Give me. A summary. How do you feel about Zack Snyder's Justice League? I'm going to go right off the bat and give you the number and say why. And that is a nine. Wow. I put it up there. That's big, man. And now maybe maybe I'm giving it a nine. I probably shouldn't because one of the reasons why I'm going to give it a high number is because we got the 2017 version. So we had such a letdown going into that. That reality is there's only one way to go, and that's up. I didn't mm-hmm. think Zack Snyder can get worse than Joss Whedon's version, and he didn't. He definitely did not go below the bar. Now we're moving that from the table. Zack, I said this in a few episodes before, Zack Snyder is what DC needs to continue their story. I cannot see another filmmaker doing what he did. And you said that he that there was a lot of dragging and a lot of lagging in this movie i can see where people might say that this was four hours of bits and pieces of dragging here and there some of his style could be a little bit long lasting than it should be to me everything has a purpose now i don't know exactly what you mean by uh dragging out some would say that because of his very gimmicky uh, slow motion scenes that he does quite a bit. 
understood. I love those things in this case. Sure, sure, sure. It's very storytelling. It captures the emotion of that very moment. Don't want to give anything away on what I'm talking sure, about in this sure, case. But sure. the parts where it was like going at, you know, a slow snail's pace, mm-hmm. you're capturing eyes, you're capturing emotions, you're capturing the moment on that very scene, on that very action. And I felt like I was a part of it. That third act was, was a lot of that. And I thought, holy shit, like you are <laughs> staring into this. There's this one uh, image in particular. I mean, I'm not going to spoil it, but uh-huh. in fact, it's it's on the internet right now. Uh, Zack Snyder posted it. It's that scene where it's the Batmobile, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Flash, yep. and Cyborg. That's yep. still. They showed that moment, and I nearly wet myself. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. That, it was a very it, cool that was moment. A mo- that was a cool moment. It was very cool. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was very, <laughs> you know, it's it's a superhero team up. And, you know, this is why people go to the movies. This is why people yeah. pay to see this stuff. You want to see your heroes come to life, and you want to see these great action sequences. And boom, they did it. And the score. Like, I loved the score. And it's like, there was that, again, that whole entire, uh, that Russian scene where the Batmobile's going through. We saw it in the Joss Whedon version. Mm-hmm. But there was something different about the delivery in this version because you see him attacking the parademons and you, it's just different. The same exact mm-hmm. scene, mm-hmm. but just little things here and there that was changed. The filter, the score, sure, the angles. Sure, and sure. it was just beautiful throughout across the uh the the scene and the whole movie yeah i mean so for me you know and for context here like i'm a lay person right like i'm not a super super dc fan it's dc eu film verse fan i like man of steel uh batman v superman uh was problematic but i enjoyed it and obviously joss whedon's justice league i i didn't Honestly, dude, like I was watching this film and, you know, uh, uh, my wife kept looking at me and she's like, did this happen in, in, in the other version? And I was like, you know, I honestly can't remember. And there's some certain moments, uh, that, that happened throughout. And I, I kept thinking to myself, I'm like, man, like, I know this is vaguely familiar, but it really speaks to how poor Joss Whedon's version was that I can't remember these major story beats. That was one of his big flaws. I mean, I, take away the personal things that's going on right now with the investigation and all that stuff, but put put into context what he did for the Avengers, the first two Avengers mm-hmm. movies. Well, maybe the first Avengers movie. The second one I didn't really – I wasn't really kind with. But uh, his vision is – it can be forgettable. I mean, take away the Avengers movies. Let's put that – actually, no, let's put that into perspective – the first one had a lot of great moments, but when you look back at the whole entire MCU, do you really remember any of Joss Whedon's films that popped out? Aside from the moment where, you know, all the Avengers teamed up, they got together, and they were in the middle of the city getting ready to do mm-hmm. battle. Was there really anything of the first two Avengers movies that said, that's a Whedon cool th- moment right there? Or do you remember more of the last two Avengers movies where you thought the Roosters brothers really nailed this one? I think, you know, that's a great question. Um, I think it's a little unfair because the Russo brothers are so recent and so uh, prominent in memory, especially with the closing of their story arc. Um, the first two Avengers films, there are a number of standout moments to me, but that may simply be because of of how beloved some of those characters are and how rewatchable those movies are. Um, Like you can put on the Avengers 2012 and you can just have it on in the background and, and not have to feel like you're focused on it for man of steel. It's not the same film. You know, you have to sit there and watch it and enjoy it. And it rewards you for doing that. Um, Joss Whedon's Justice League, by contrast, it asks you to sit and watch it, but it doesn't give you the same rewards. And it, 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 man, this is, there is no bigger testament to the Snyder Cut than, than this conversation we're having, in my opinion, because I literally cannot remember 
a lot of the original version. And uh, uh, my wife, Cipriana, is in the other room, and she's actually watching the original version right now because she's so curious, like, what was so different? And she she's sending me um, – <laughs> she's sending me – screen caps like steppenwolf looks like you know basically neutered and dude steppenwolf in this movie is freaking awesome badass yo right like, like he is a compelling villain and that's a villain yes, exactly yes like i was like i was like okay 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 he lands he comes down and 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 on the amazon island and he's tearing shit up and you're just like Damn, these Amazonian girls are, you know, they're, they're, they're fucking fierce. You know, they're, they're putting it down. You know, they're, they're killing, they're slicing, they're dicing, you know, they're dashing, they're diving, you know, and they're, they're doing these crazy bow and arrow moves or on horseback. And yes, some of the CGI during some of that sequence was not up to par. And you know what? It didn't matter to me because the actual, the action, the compelling story that was being told, it, it told my brain, don't even worry about it. Don't even worry about it. You know, and that says something really strong, which goes back to what you were saying about uh, Whedon and Snyder. Snyder is basically the better storyteller in my eyes. I mean, I don't want to compare the two directors, but when if you're going to put them in the same movie, which we just did, Snyder nailed it. I mean, like you said, uh, you know, you can walk away from a Whedon film and not really skip a beat because it's just background mo- noise for the most part. But when you're yeah. watching a Snyder film, especially this one, yeah, it's four hours long, but you want to be attached to it. And when mm-hmm. it's all said and done, you don't feel like it was a waste. It was definitely worth those four hours. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, like I said, I had to step away, you know, we took multiple breaks, you know, had to go make dinner, grab a couple of drinks, you know, um, you know, and, and, and of course we started it like in the middle of our work day. So we had to stop right. and, you know, go do some work and, and stuff. Uh, but you know, when I said earlier that I felt like the film kind of dragged, uh, and you alluded to this, it's, it's Zack Snyder's storytelling and the way he, the way he pans across and some of these slow motion shots. And I'm thinking about some certain scenes where a character is like brushing their hand against, you know, some leaves, you know, in a field and, and they're, they're gazing out. And there's a lot of these types of scenes where different heroes are gazing out at, at the horizon, right? And I kept thinking to myself, like, okay, 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 you know, like waiting and waiting for something to happen for more action. And I realize it's not that kind of film. This is a more, oh man, it's almost a, it's almost weird to call it a cerebral superhero movie, but that's kind of what this is supposed to be. Yeah. Um, you hit, you hit that perfectly because in Man of Steel, take example there, um, he worked with Christopher Nolan in that movie. Nolan mm. was a producer of that film and as his yeah. wife was. So I kind of see a little bit of Nolan's work through Snyder's stuff as far as, like you said, cerebral context. Um, there's more depth and emotion behind these characters. There's actual struggle and despair. Uh Cyborg yeah. MVP in that movie, and you saw oh his pain God. in that movie. We're, I mean, we're, we're gonna have we're gonna have a. I don't know if you want to sidebar this particular part and finish your thought, or or if you want to go into cyborg stuff now. But I can't wait to talk about that. No, I mean we yeah we can talk about that like right now because that's what I was kind of gonna get at is that there's emotion there. He Zack Snyder broke down every single character. We didn't need too much on Batman or Wonder Woman because mm-hmm. we already got those in yeah. BVS. But Flash, we got Cyborg, a little bit of Aquaman, even though he had his own movie already. Mm-hmm. But they all had their moments to, you know, showcase their best work. And yeah, Ray Fisher, bravo Yo, on man. his yeah. work. And yeah, shame on Z- uh, Joss Whedon and Warner Brothers for cutting their his part out in the 2017 version because what the hell were they thinking? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I, I I did read quite a few, uh, think pieces online regarding Ray Fisher, his, his role as cyborg, you know, and and how central he is to the main storyline. And when you step back and you think to yourself, Whoa, Joss Whedon cut all like basically 95% of Ray Fisher from that film. And like, you know what? He was just the, you know, like to Joss, who 
I suppose. I mean, you know, I'm just gonna say it. It feels like Ray Fisher was Joss Whedon's token black man in the superhero film. That's what it felt like. And here, you know, he gets a central role. He gets a hero moment. He gets more than a hero moment. He has a full story arc. And there's a moment uh, in the third act where you're glued to the screen and you feel his pain and you feel the despair and you're just like it hits and it's so well done, well acted, well played. And you have to think about these actors in front of green screens 90% of the time they're they're you know the prosthetic work and all the mocap suits that they're wearing and you think to yourself how can actors act and then you see that come to life on film and it just blows your mind to think about and it's wow like it's that's art you know when i say cerebral superhero movie that's that that is what i am referring to and Oh wow, I, I was I was super impressed, and knowing that Joss Whedon cut so much of that, and understanding more of why Ray Fisher was, you know, he's so outspoken and vocal about Joss Whedon's, uh, you know, faults and criticizing him and, and basically going after him makes a ton of fucking sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I've done a few acting gigs back in my heyday. But uh, I never had a chance to really work. On a, I, I did work in a green screen, but not to the level of these guys did. I was never really a central part like Ray Fisher or, you know, or really a tentpole movie like this to this magnitude. But that's talent. Like you said, that's just skill to a whole new level. And to be denied that talent because I don't know what the reason was, why Joss Whedon chose what he did. But it was just a shame and just – it's heartbreaking, really, to see that kind of work be put aside and to think that Warner Brothers didn't even want this movie to ever see the light of day. So we were never going to see this if it wasn't for the reaction of the fans saying, hey, give us what we should have gotten. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, Ray Fisher has every right to be upset. All these guys have every right to be upset. So, you know, kudos to Ray for just sticking his guns. That is definitely a thought that um, – uh, so so – you know, my wife is a, she listens to our podcast and, and she mentioned it several times. She's like, and I completely agree. Like, we feel so bad for these actors for the, for, for so many years, like having to basically, uh, you know, essentially keep their mouth shut, right? And, and not be as vocal as maybe they wanted to be. Like, they supported this. Yes. You know, they hashtagged it. We talked about that. You know, Ray Fisher comes out guns blazing. Warner Brothers says, Oh, we're taking remedial action on Joss Sweden. You know, whatever the hell that means and just shoving it away. And you have to think like, man, Henry Cavill, Gal Gadot, um, you know, even Jared Leto, you know, like what we got in this is leagues above what came out a couple of years ago. And, man, these actors must be so freaking happy to see this, uh, pardon the pun, but this film done justice. It's not only that. It's just... Uh, the uh, they're, I mean, they should be grateful for this. I mean... And for no other reason, I mean, maybe more can come out of this. Maybe we'll get a better deal out of this. But, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what else to really say to that moment. But uh, they have absolutely they – they should be happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, so, so – wow. Just four hours – it was it was damn good. Like you know, I, I, I'm I'm legitimately impressed. I saw the runtime, all this hype surrounding it, and of course knowing what the theatrical cut was a couple of years ago, you know I I think like you, uh, I, I was really nervous about it. You know, it's like man, four hours of my day, like ah oh, shit, I gotta sit down. It's honestly, dude, this movie could have never worked until today. Like in this streaming you know, video on demand environment that we live in. Um, yeah. I mean, justice league, Zack Snyder cut four hour film 
no one would have paid money to go see that besides like hardcore fans. You know, you see four hour runtime and you, you, you want to be guaranteed an experience. And this was a risky move and HBO putting up that money going out on a limb. You know, I don't know what kind of backdoor deals were done with Warner brothers to get the license for this, but it was worth it in my opinion. I mean, it's, you wonder if COVID was a blessing in this case. I mean, not to put any light into what's going on in the last year and, well, actually mm. 12 months exactly. But at the same time, do you really think that without – if we didn't have COVID or if we didn't have these lockdowns or restrictions, would this movie even go to theaters? Or That's would it point. Would it even go into HBO Max? Would this even be a thought process? So, you know, you had, you know – for example, Marvel that was considering back and forth with mm-hmm. putting Black Widow on their uh, their Disney Plus platform. You saw them put Mulan on their Disney mm-hmm. Plus platform. Didn't do nearly as well. But you saw them put uh, WandaVision up there in the front lines mm-hmm. to say, hey, we got this going on. So streaming service kind of capitalized on this opportunity. And I'm pretty sure HBO Max and particularly AT&T was like, all right. We got these this content here that a lot of fans want. Why the hell not? I mean, what's the worst yeah. that can happen at this point? So, you know, did they feel like this was a one and done thing? Were they just doing it because you know what? Let's shut these fans up. I don't know, but hopefully they don't take us too lightly because now that we saw this, the hashtag restore uh, uh, release the Snyder cut. All right, we got our win there, but now we're doing a new hashtag. Hashtag restore the Snyder Cut and the Snyderverse for that matter right? because we want more content. And there is more content out there. It's not filmed, obviously, but there are ideas. There are visions out mm-hmm. there that we want to see come to life like we did last uh, this morning. That's true. That's true. I mean, look, look at the playing field for streaming services right now, right? You have Netflix, the old standby. You know, Netflix has been around, gosh, since what, like 1998? They yeah, started, like, while. sending out DVDs. Yeah. And and now they, they buy up all this content. You know, they're, they're a huge distributor. And the problem with Netflix is that they have so much content that it's like a – it's it's – it fries your brain. <laughs> you know, you, you go through and you click, you scroll, and you're like, that looks good, that looks good, that looks good. But you never land on anything. You never pick anything. But you're subscribed to it anyway. You have streaming services like Amazon Prime Video, which is starting to up their game. You know, they're starting to put out original series. you got Marvelous Miss Maisel. you got The Boys, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you have some newcomers to the game like Apple TV+. Plus. you got Peacock. Uh, and HBO Max, you know, they launched not uh, like right, right – God, when the hell did HBO Max launch? But it's been recent. It's about, about a year ago. Yeah. Yeah. So they have to compete. They are in this space now with, with all this you know, scripted television content content movie content and they want people in the seats streaming is is up over uh uh, over 30 percent this past year more people are streaming content than ever before they're leaving their cable services they're not watching movies on cable anymore no one wants to deal with commercials they want to pay for something and they want to get a good damn deal so hbo they have to get this great content and they have to pull from places that, you know, especially in, in this COVID era, they can't exactly have these big, giant, sweeping production sets like they used to. And, you know, bang, bang, get it all done, get it on air, and get that money back. Now they have to be more strategic about it. How was this filmed? You know, where are we shooting? Are we on a closed set? Do we have a closed room of cast? Is all of our cast member uh, quarantined in the same facility? So if one guy gets COVID, then we know everyone's locked down, yada, 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 yada. Or, you know, like the case we talked about last time with Robert Pattinson. They had to shut down production because he got COVID. He had to, you know, he fell sick. Then he comes back. He's not in shape. And then they're wasting all this time. They're wasting all this money on the shoe in this case the filming was done and all zach had to do was take all that footage recut it and uh obviously you know the vfx work updated looked amazing the removal of that that weird hazy orange filter from the movie yeah beautifully done it felt 
it felt more realistic. It felt I know that the, a big criticism towards DC films like oh they're too gritty, but it really worked for this movie in particular. It felt grounded. That's DC style, Mike. I mean, they've always been grounded like that, and they should always be a grounded and gritty alternative to Marvel. Marvel's always going to be the mainstream. That was one of the arguments that I had with uh, some people out there on the interwebs, is that they say that they can't compete with Marvel. Marvel's always going to be the best. And my whole argument is, you can't catch up to Marvel. Marvel will always be ahead of the mm-hmm. game and that's not a diss on dc clearly not a diss on dc marvel's been there since 2008 yeah even if you remove the 2017 version of justice league and they streamlined from 2013's man of steel straight into where we are today if they would have done that today we would have had the third justice league movie a flashpoint movie mm-hmm. and a second or maybe even a third man of steel movie even all of that, Marvel would still be ahead of the game. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to say, well, Marvel's the best. They've been doing more of these. Duh. Yeah, they have a decade on everybody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it feels like there's someone over at Warner Brothers who's like, I don't want to make us any money, so we're not going to do these things that we should do. And, you know, I get they want to differentiate themselves from Marvel and they want to be different, and that's cool and all, but, like, Fans want these characters. They want them on screen. They want these movies. I want Man of Steel too. You know, like that's that's a movie that I legitimately want. Henry Cavill as Superman is amazing. Yes. And um, you know, there's a moment in in Justice League uh, Snyder Cut uh, where you know a, a big big hero moment. You know, I'm not going to spoil it, but literally, I was yelling. I was mm-hmm. yelling at the screen. I was so happy. You know. And I, and and how it plays out, you know, like like you and I are in video, so I'm not going to talk about it. But you're going to watch me, and you're going to go, and you're going to know. I what know I'm talking exactly about. what scene you were when you, know you started talking, talking about. about that. Yep, I'm like, yep, that was such a cool moment. Oh, it was man. much better intro than uh, uh, Whedon did in 2017. The difference was uncanny because when I saw the 2017 version of Henry Cavill, I'm thinking Christopher Reeves. I mm. thought that uh, not so much campy, but very lighthearted version of Superman. Mm. And that's kind of what Henry Cavill brought at that moment that you're – and that third act. Yeah. In the moment that you're talking about, the one that we're in sync with, there was still a level of arrogance, but it was so much Ugh. more satisfying just to see his reaction and to see what he does. My with, boy like, brought the swagger. Yeah. It's what they call <laughs> chef's kiss. Mm. That was just perfect. Mwah. Yep. Mwah. That's Henry Cavill. Mwah. That's our Superman right there. So oh. kudos to him. That is, that is that is my Geralt of Rivia moment right there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you talk about uh, streaming services and how that's the future. This movie, and again, not trying to spoil anything, but at uh, the epilogue, there is an epilogue. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you know, yeah, there's an epilogue. Uh, there's a moment there that kind of hints at something that I would hope brings out a Batman miniseries, which has mm. been talked about, has been rumored. And why Zack Snyder brought this piece out, I don't... I mean, m- many would think that, okay, this was the original idea. Then it got reworked into what Joss Whedon gave us four years ago. And now Zack brought this back. So maybe that opens the door for Warner Brothers or AT and T or whoever is calling the shots now to say, you know what, Ben, you want to beat, you want to wear the cowl again? Yes, I do. You got your miniseries or you got your standalone movie, something. But there's definitely room to make something out of this in their streaming service now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would, I would continue my subscription to HBO Max if they greenlit a proper Batman miniseries of this kind that we are currently discussing because that epilogue, you know, no spoilers, but that epilogue uh, definitely made, uh, you know, everybody in the house sit up and go, hold up a second. What's up with this? This is very intriguing mm-hmm. you know, and um, very cool. Very cool stuff. Yeah. I mentioned, I believe on Instagram, because I was going crazy on it uh, last night with uh, the Snyder thon that I was putting together. I said that I had 
a different opinion reserved for Eisenberg. Because one of the things that I was critical of was the casting mm-hmm. of BBS. And one of them originally was Jesse Eisenberg as Lex Luthor. Didn't like it at first. Didn't mm-hmm. think it was a good choice. Watching the epilogue, how he is portrayed. I mean, I don't think I'm spoiling anything. I think uh, we saw this in the Joss Whedon version, Mm -hmm. I think. And it got brought back into this version. I think Jesse Eisenberg can do it. I think if we had a... I know, I've seen a look on your face, Mike. I, mean, <laughs> I, it, I know, it is a very unpopular opinion. Not a lot of people like Eisenberg as um, as Luther. I think there are others above that were ahead of him, too. I thought my, my, uh, Michael Rosenbaum in mm. Smallville was a great Lex Luthor. But if you give another chance to Eisenberg, you put him in a Man of Steel movie, or you put him in uh, a future DC project... I think what we saw that little glimpse in Justice League could be a better version of what we got in BBS. So, yeah, I mean, you saw, you saw the look on my face. Uh, I mean, I, I'll disagree with you. Um, I, I was not convinced. If he had dialed back some of that, some of that zaniness, then I probably would have, would be more in line with you on that. But you're talking about Batman versus Superman, right? No, no, no. I'm talking about the epilogue. You thought there was zaniness in there? I didn't. I just didn't like, you know, the the, the facial tics that he was doing. It, it 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 was too much, you know. Like Batman already goes up against the Joker. He already goes up against the Riddler, who already embodied those characteristics. Mm-hmm. And Lex Luthor was was never that type. He was always more uh, more a little bit more sinister and a little bit more overt in that. You know? Right. And Eisenberg plays plays like. You know this uh, this very frenetic kind of a, a person version of Luther, yeah. where you know he's just like oh yeah oh yeah you know and his eyes are darting back and forth, and I, it just it turned me off. It just turned me off. I didn't see that in the epilogue. I definitely saw that in BVS, and I did not enjoy that at all. And I thought this is a terrible casting <laughs> choice. But when I saw the epilogue, and even in the end credits of Justice of Justice League, I thought okay. Maybe. And then the epilogue. There is potential. I I thought he toned it down personally. I he, thought he, did, did. he did tone it down from, from Batman v Superman, but it wasn't to the point where I really that I was um that I could subscribe to it. You know, like like I wasn't there. It didn't it didn't bring me all the way there. And part of it is and I'll be honest, like it's a little bit of bias because I don't really like Jesse Eisenberg as an actor. <laughs> So, you know, I mean, I'm not a crazy Eisenberg f- fan either. I mean, I hate, I mean, maybe because he's so good at me being pissed off at him that maybe it does work. He's smarmy. He's got like the smarmy look about him. And, and I can't take him seriously as like a mastermind kind of a villain. You know what, though? You say that and I would agree with you, except now, see, I follow the, uh, the DC TV, uh, shows yes jo- do you know who john crier is uh yeah yeah i do he's lex luther in the dc tv shows in the Arrowverse. yep that look right there and that's the exact look that i gave when i saw him but you know what john crier did a mediocre <laughs> job All he right. wasn't he was not he he wasn't two and a half men i mean th- this is this these are cw shows right yes yeah so yeah yeah, yeah. i mean that's fine that's fine i that's mean fine. and i yeah I would put Eisenberg above that. If you that and that fair one enough. cameo, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. I think also part of it is like uh, Jesse Eisenberg isn't uh, he doesn't have the aged up factor. Like he looks significantly younger than Henry Cavill. You know, I will give you that a hundred percent. I think. I mean, it's not. It's too late now because he's already cast in a DC movie. The Rock should have been Je- uh, Lex Luthor. Oh wow, dude, that blows my mind. That Can would you imagine be, that? That would be intense. Yes, yeah, oh I would have God. preferred that. The size, the size, the the, the, the arrogance. Yep. The, yep. The arrogance. That yeah. Charis- yeah. And yep. 
And like, you know, Dwayne Johnson in Ballers, like he rocks all these killer suits, you know, the three piece, the pinstripe. That's it. You know, yep. he can, he plays that off. He rocks the gold. Like, yeah, man. Yeah. He would have oh, been man. perfect. But you blew my mind with that. Oh, I'm going to be sitting with this now. It's a talk on the Internet that if there was ever going to be a Lex Luthor, it should have been him. But instead, we went the other way and gave, we got Eisenberg. And now also The Rock's being um He's Black Adam in a few right. DC movies, so right. we're not going to get that clearly. But it's, it's wishful thinking. It's wishful thinking. Uh, how did you feel about Ezra Miller as Flash? Uh, I tried to distance himself from uh, – I forgot the actor's name. He's on the TV – in the CW version of the Flash. Ezra uh, Miller? Well, no, Ezra that's Miller that, is in, is that's in the DC. Or... Yeah, no, I'm talking about the right. uh, CW version. Um, I forgot his name. Uh, but uh, I'm trying to distance those two apart. But Ezra, not bad. I think he did a great job. There were certain scenes where they kept in jo- uh, Zack Snyder's version where I thought was a Joss Whedon take and it was actually Zack Snyder's and I thought eh, maybe a little too much uh, personality in that mm-hmm. um, overall I think there is I can't I'm very interested in what we're going to see in the Flash movie next I think it's next year mm. hmm. another per, another thing I also tried distancing from was uh, well not distancing but compared to is the um, the DCAU, the animated universe. Uh, ah, yeah. There's a lot of that where I tried connecting to and I tried not to at the same time because they're different. Sure. But, uh, I saw a little bit here and there. I mean, a much better improvement from 2017. I did not care for all, all of the snarky remarks that he had. Uh, you know, him mentioning about his, you know, blood sugar level or uh his uh i forgot <laughs> his what calorie else he intake yeah the calorie like he, he uh he's, he's like uh you know it's like oh snacks just go through me like like i'm a black hole i'm a, a snack, snack hole. hole but he, yeah he brought I, that up in I this chuckled. one too i'm like all right like, <laughs> that that's one of those things where i was like i could leave it or take it uh see, i don't want to spoil it but there was a scene you. there was you. a scene in the third act where i'm like okay this is what I could have for the rest of his career. Mm. If he can keep going with this, mm-hmm. on it. Yeah, uh, I, I'm I'm on the opposite end with you. I really liked his portrayal um, in this film. Uh, I thought the Flash was great. I thought the story with his father was really touching, and uh, you know those scenes in the prison where Barry Allen is meeting with his dad it is is really nice and it gives the character a good motivation for doing what he's doing mm-hmm. and uh I, I you know as, as a viewer i connected with the motivation side of it um whether it truly lands with every viewer or not is neither here nor there because it didn't take up uh, so much screen time that it felt overdone. Like those scenes right. when, when he connected yeah. with his dad. Yeah, it just you know it was it was good good touching moment. And his the introduction to him and his power at the at the at the uh, at the puppy daycare that was just <laughs> fun. I thoroughly enjoyed that. I loved every moment and Zack Snyder taking the time like to show uh you know the flash like looking up at this pretty girl who he's about to catch in his arms and he's like, Oh gosh, she's just so pretty and then he like he saves her and, and, and you know, lays her down safely and then jumps back into the puppy daycare to complete his what he was doing in there. I don't want to ruin it. No, <laughs> it's I know. Fun. It's fun. Yeah. You, you know why I think I'm a little bit uh, I don't favor him as much as you are. It's because when I see those moments, I saw Quicksilver in the X-Men uh, movies. Okay. okay. So I'm, I'm kind of seeing both of them, and I'm like, eh, I've seen this, though. And I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it's already been done. And I kind of wanted something yeah. a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I hear what you're saying because I immediately thought of that when they're in the drum when they uh when they meet with Steppenwolf okay. and 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 you know it's the first fight with Steppenwolf. I don't think that's a spoiler because if you don't think that there's a fight coming up with the villain then I don't what know now? you don't say. <laughs> I don't know where you've been the past like 50 years of movies. <laughs> You're not supposed to fight. There's supposed to be um, 
but yeah, he's like he's he's running around the big drum, and I keep thinking to myself, I'm like, I have a hundred percent seen this before. Yeah, yeah. So I, I yeah. mean, like I said, I don't I didn't dislike the character. I just feel like I've seen it before, and if maybe it toned down a little bit, if he was more of a dick, I think I would be a little more really? favor towards him. Yeah. Really, I, I, I kind of like his 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 happy go lucky like you know naive kind of a play on the character. I mean, I guess I guess we can agree to disagree on that one. I mean, I don't know. Fair. I felt I feel like him being more of a a jerk would have been more suited. But then again, so is Green Lantern. He was kind of a bit of a douche too. So if that means we're gonna get him in a future Justice League movie, you know, hopefully, I'm okay with that happy-go-lucky version of mm-hmm. the flash so i mean we'll see yeah no i mean um uh, i i know you i know your boy aquaman you know is, is your boy and all but he was definitely not my favorite of this film he was toned down yeah so in my whole thing is i think the spotlight was more on him in 2017, less on him in this one. I don't know if that was intentional. Hmm. I felt like, and the reason why, and we'll probably jump into this because hey, this is a podcast about this guy. Uh, I feel hmm. like in 2017, Jason Momoa's ver- uh, Aquaman overshadowed that badassness on top of Bruce Wayne. And yeah, Bruce Wayne yeah. is always the badass in the group and i felt like jason momoa overshadowed that in 2017 oh, yeah. whereas in two, in this version it was corrected it felt like you know ben affleck did his job and jason momoa's aquaman was kind of like there in a yeah. good way though i'm not saying that you know he was uh, he was forgettable i'm just saying that if you're gonna put the two in the same room right bruce wayne should be top bill yeah, yeah. I mean, they kind of fill that same uh, niche where they're where they're kind of brawlers in that way. Um, you know, obviously Aquaman, he he's got the you know he's got the blood of the old gods, right? Like he he's he's the man. Uh, and Bruce Wayne is rich, so <laughs> like they can't they can't really go head to head in, in that respect. Um, but you know. Batman is a brawler. Like, he can go hand-to-hand with anybody. And then you give Jason Momoa, who's a brawler, uh, in the same room, and you're like, well, you know, if if I'm picking my team here, I'm not going to pick two tanks, you know? I'm going to want to diversify my uh, my my arrangement here, my team. You know, you want to have at least two healers, you want to have two tanks, and you want to have two DPS. That's generally the way you want to roll. <laughs> Are we playing Risk now? <laughs> Which is... well, I was thinking Overwatch. I was thinking Overwatch. But oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're trying to push the payload here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I get that. Yeah, uh... yeah, but I check guess... this out. Check this out. When we first – first of all, I loved how we met uh, Aquaman in this film. That was way better than the 2017 take. Are we talking about the intro? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, I f- there were similarities. I mean, it was the same scene, essentially. But uh, it's weird. Going back to what we were saying earlier, it was uh, just – it was the same scene, but the atmosphere was yeah. different. Like, I don't know what it was, but I, it felt right. Like, this wasn't forced. This wasn't something that was – you know, light or anything. I don't know. It was different. It was a lot different. And his introduction in this movie was a lot better. Mm -hmm. It was a lot more badassery. And, uh, you know, you you did actually, in a sense, did butt heads with Bruce Wayne and Arthur Curry. And it was Mm -hmm. more fulfilling than what we got four years ago. Yeah, yeah, um, it's it's good. It's good. And, and and one one of the cheesiest lines in the 2017 version was, "Oh, you talk to fish." <laughs> I and, hated that. And that that wasn't here. You know, it, yeah. it, it felt more. Um, it did feel more like Bruce Wayne had more of a reverence for who he was talking to here, as opposed to like, "Well, <laughs> I'm a rich kid." Bleh. So it, it it was nice. Like it, it was a nice different take on on that introduction 
Uh, and yeah, you know, like Whedon, Joss Whedon always had that like hokiness to to his humor, to his comedy that he would always interject into his films. Um, and you know, they definitely they fit in the Marvel universe because it's very you know it's kind of a hokey t- kind of a humor. Right. But in the DCEU, you know, that grounded, you know, yes. They're, they're 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 comic book superheroes you know like they're lifted from the page and you know some of the shots you know you feel like you're you're looking at the graphic novel come to life and it's amazing but that humor style didn't fit and having that not in this really lifted lifted the story in a big way it never did fit for this. I mean, you can always throw like a sprinkle of comedy in there, but you don't put the entire bag in there. And I think that's what Whedon did in the first version. Whereas in this one, and <laughs> I hate that version that Bruce Wayne would say. He said it twice, actually. He said in the first, in the intro, he said, well, you you talk to fish. And then he said it again when they're all suited up, ready to go into, I think it was in Russia. He's like, yeah. I want you to put out a, a thing, you know, an aquatic do you talk to fish? Like he was like, <laughs> he like got dumb. Like why is Bruce Wayne yeah. that un- he does not come off as un- or intelligent. He came off very dopey in that moment. And I didn't appreciate that at all. Like that doesn't belong in a DC movie, especially in a character like Batman where he's you know 90% <gasps> of the time serious, 10% of the time a dick. Yeah. And you know, art and one of the things I was kind of worried about when Aquaman was being brought into the, the cinematic universe was that no one ever took him seriously. I mean, Aquaman was that guy who was like, you know, he just sits in the ocean all day. I think even Family Guy made a reference about Aquaman being the most useless comic book character of all time. <laughs> yeah. And Joss, or uh, Zack Snyder did a fantastic job making him relevant, making him badass, making mm-hmm. him just a member of the league and not just someone that just yeah. you call upon whenever you want to get a whale to take you across the land. So, you know, that's just how, yeah. how it should be. That's how it should have always been, was to give a little groundness, a little grittiness to the characters. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Wonder Woman. Wow. So first off, I just want to say that uh, the the scene with the Amazons that we open with, basically, mm. oh, man, I talked about it earlier. Beautifully shot. Really love the action sequences there. Love the fight. I loved uh, you know meeting Steppenwolf and and seeing that brutality for the first time. That was just really well done. Really set the stage for the gravity of the film's arc and um man see uh, you know what this is a non-spoiler review and all i'm gonna say is that there are several camera shots of amazonian warriors and you're just like god damn like like ah, I, I i give you my sword you know how do i how do I ride into battle with you? I just, I want to be there. I want to support you. Oh my God. <laughs> it's such a, it's such a fulfilling and satisfying way to start a freaking movie. Can we also discuss that mixed with the beautiful score that was happening in the background? Yes. Uh, that Amazonian tune. I don't know what you want to call it. Um, Oh, uh, so so we watch with subtitles very often, mm-hmm. um, and and the subtitles for that uh, every time was ancient lamentation. That's a thing. That's a thing. It was okay, just, ancient it was lamentation. Ancient, ancient lamentation music, and we're like, oh, okay, okay, yeah. I mean, I'm gonna Google is. that. And I'm gonna put that in my Alexa. <laughs> put that to go to sleep with that. But you know, that reminded me of like Xena, warrior princess. Mm-hmm. Just every time oh, she yeah. rode into Greece in her horse with Gabrielle on her back, you know, <laughs> just waving her sword and doing that war cry scream. I was like, I can totally see Xena running through. The, the island and just slaughtering all of the parademons along with the Amazonians. That oh, was yeah. just a great, like you said, great scene, great imagery, great cinem- cinematography right there. And uh, going into Wonder Woman, she seemed a lot more broken in this. Not honestly, yeah, I'm going to say broken compared okay. to uh, a little of the Whedon version. Okay. Do, do you agree? 
Uh, I, I think she was a little bit – maybe broken is not the word I would use. I'm trying Con- to find a different word. Conflicted, Contemplative. Right? Oh, right. Contemplative is the word that I personally would use. Conflicted works too, I think. Um, it seemed to me that she was feeling the guilt of not having been home. She see, yeah, like she seemed very homesick. Yeah, <laughs> like when she heard that uh, Stephen Wolf slaughtered her sisters, and you know, kind of bluffed that. She, uh, oh, I'm not going to say what happened, but uh, you know, yeah. Wonder Woman would look at him and say liar, and but the way she said it was like, I. She's like, I kind of believe you. Yeah, she's like, I'm so, calling she, you a liar, and she I, almost lost her yeah. shit on that moment. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, like don't mm-hmm. lose it, don't lose your cool. So yeah, I. I guess homesick would be where she felt yeah, kind of yeah. disconnected. Well, like she, she's definitely carrying this, you know, this feeling of like I should have been there. It should have been me. It should have yeah. been me. It's like it's survivor's guilt, you know, which which um, you know <laughs> is something that a lot of people are dealing with also in this pandemic, mm. and I think can relate to, um, you know. Uh, and I, I really got to say, I really enjoyed. Uh, Gal Gadot in this significantly more than I did in the 2017 cut. Uh, and, you know, I know about the controversy with um, Joss Whedon forcing a scene and having to use a body double to make the Flash, you know, fall into, into Wonder Woman's breasts. And I remember cringing at that and being like, yeah, you know, like, that's stupid. We didn't, we never needed that in the first place, and, and nobody asked for it. So why are you forcing it on everybody? And, right. and uh, it's nice to see that Wonder Woman was taken very seriously here and, you know, she wasn't sexualized in any way. She wasn't, you know, forced on screen to be like, this is where the male gaze should go. You know, like her her fucking dope outfit was dope, you know, and the armor looked great, you know, and and the scenes that she had, you know, she's she's athletic and she's strong. And and she turns, you know, when when we have that first big moment with her and she saves the kids. And she turns to the little girl and she's like, you can be whatever you want to be. It's like, yep. you know, it's, I like that message. It's Wonder Woman. Yeah. It's Wonder Woman, you know, like, yeah. That was, that's all she needed too. Like, that was her moment where she just basically said to that little girl, you can be whatever you want. And you didn't get that in 2017. You just had her as just a character that was there, a prop for the most part. Yeah. Whereas Zack Snyder enhanced her best features in that movie, which was the message of love and do whatever you want. And, um, it's kind of I don't think Zach meant to do this and this movie was made before I uh, Wonder Woman 84 but it kind of took away what she did in the sequel not saying that she did bad in it and just saying that you know Wonder Woman 84 is now an afterthought after seeing yeah. her in this movie yeah, 100% agree 100% agree I mean you know Wonder Woman 84 we briefly touched on it uh, you and I I didn't. I didn't like that film really, and uh, <laughs> um, it, it's 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 really frustrating to know that that film takes place in 1984, and then we have this modern day story being told, and they feel like completely different characters, you know. And, yeah. and it's like you know, it's only you know, it's it's only 40 years basically in between the events of, and a lot can happen in those 40 years. Uh, but it's like, where was your invisible jet? Where was this ability that you had to fly? Where, where was, you know, like you had all these things. And it, you, I felt like in the 2017 version, you know, you could have been like, you know, what the heck? How come she didn't do this? But in this recut, there were sequences where I felt like some of those skills had carried over. And some of that ability that she had, obviously we didn't see the invisible jet, thank God. Um, <laughs> some things we could leave in the comics, folks, all right? Uh, that was one of them, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it felt, you know, whether intentional or not, it felt real. It felt good. It felt like a, a proper, um, oh my God, continuation of her character. For sure. Uh <laughs> It almost felt like they kind of retcon eighty four. It yes, was like yes, that's it a was like way to say it. That uh, Batman versus Superman, Wonder Woman, her first one, and then this Justice League, and we completely ignored Justice League. We completely ignored eighty four, and now we can focus on something else. That's not what I don't think they're going to do. I, I don't think that they're going to sound like it. No, I think they're going to keep going with the second movie and then into a third one. But at the same time, it's like, well, how, where do you go with the third? 
uh, Wonder Woman movie? Do you carry the continuity from Zack Snyder's version, or do you carry the continuity from Patty Jenkins' version? You know, I mean, personally, you, you, in, in my mind, the only version that exists is Gal Gadot. So whatever she wants to do, you go with her. Yeah, because she, you know, like, um, she's really brought uh, Diana Prince to the screen. I remember when they first cast her that they said that, oh, but they, I mean, like the internet, you know, the the smarties of the interwebs, the smarks, oh, saying yes. that, you know, you know, she's way too thin, she's not believable, ah, and, and, you know, that's what a gym membership is for. That's what a personal trainer is for. And she owned it. Like, I'm sorry, I mean, I'm not trying to sexualize her, but she is gorgeous in the movie. She is smart as hell. She carries that character with her, even outside the the... the yeah, the studio. I mean, she has a message to send to kids. She wants kids to grow up to be what they want to be. She is very empathetic towards, you know, the heartache that's going on in the world. She is Diana Prince. You know, Gal Gadot is carrying Wonder Woman very well on screen and off screen. So yeah. for people to say she was un or she wasn't believable as Diana Prince, f you, <laughs> because she did a great job and she was a great choice. Granted. When she did, um, when I first saw her in Fast and Furious back in 2009, mm. if you saw that and then immediately said, that's our Wonder Woman, okay, I get it. But wow. she's evolved. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, she's evolved in the years. And, you know, when you saw her in the the suit for the, for the stills, it's like, oh, let's see what she's got. And she yeah. did a great job in Batman versus Superman for her debut feature. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I mean, you know, all, all the all the women that were cast for for the Amazons were, you know, striking, just you know, gorgeous, you know, well well um, well acted uh, right from the outset. You have the first warrior, you know, turning around to alert the queen, and you see like that look of like, oh shit, it's about to happen, you know, and and, and then you have the warriors, you know, falling on their swords, you know, to help help the queen and everything, and you're just like. You know, like I said earlier, you just want to be there. You want to give your sword. You want to fall on your sword with them. You want to die for them. <laughs> like, like that's that's those inspirational moments. And all those women really live up to the role. I don't think I would look good at any of those outfits, though, by the way. I don't know, I don't... man. You could pull it off. You My legs are off. way too hairy for that. <laughs> Listen, I'm trying man. to see. Huh. You, you, you can pull it off. If you can pull off Jason Momoa, you can pull off Batman, you know. Maybe not Flash. You you are not. I'm, I'm sorry. Like you know, you're not thin enough for for Flash. <laughs> no, I'm all right with but, that. But you could you could rock it. You could rock it. I'm sure. I'm trying to find out uh, her uh, Wonder Woman's mother. She Connie Nelson. She did stuff. She was in Gladiator. But I'm trying to think. She did something else that springs to mind. I can't really find her right now. But. Yeah, she was a good choice. I mean, she very much be- is believable as, you know, the mother of a goddess or a demigod. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yep, she was in Gladiator for sure. That's a I classic. She was, I thought she was in something else. Um, Gladiator, wow. I mean... She's got a hell of a resume. She's recognizable. Yeah, yeah, but I just, I thought there was something else that yeah, stood she's out. She's in a lot of TV shows. Um... Following, yeah. Anyway, mm. um, bringing it around to our man Ben Affleck rocking the cape and cowl. Yes. Uh, uh, first impressions, you know, like they definitely didn't spend nearly as much time with him in this film. It's four hours long, and I felt like I, I, I felt like not enough Batfleck. I don't think it was needed this time. You're like not I wrong. Said, I mean, we had him in BVS. Mm-hmm. Um, he did that was his own hit movie right there. I mean, he, you put him and Henry Cavill there. Yeah, obviously Superman is Superman, but at the end of the day, people kept talking about Ben Affleck just owning that mm-hmm. movie. When Justice League came around, it's like, well, you already have a super team right there. You're trying to showcase these guys that have never mm-hmm. seen the big screen before. You've already seen Ben Affleck in one movie. You've already seen him do a cameo in. Um, 
in Suicide Squad. Mm -hmm. So it's like he, and you know, he kind of is like the pseudo leader of Justice League. So you really don't have to showcase everything he has. He's already supplying, you know, the jet. He's supplying the Batmobile. (laughs) He's applying the cave. He's funding the Justice League for the most part. So he could kind of take a back seat and go, all right, you guys do this because my superpower is in fact, I'm rich. You guys (laughs) can fight the bad guys. You guys can do fighting. Yeah. 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 No, you you're you're absolutely right. I was uh I was surprised we didn't get more and it worked. It definitely served the story. Uh you know, um Ben Affleck did a great job. Uh I, it did feel like he was turning on the bat voice and at some points it just was like a little distracting. I'm like, "Why are you turning it on here? These are your friends. They all know what you sound like." You know. <laughs> Wait. Mm, I'm trying to think of a scene without giving anything away. Uh Oh, you mean like when he has the cowl off? Yeah. Or, uh, I got, yeah. Yeah. Like, like he's got the cowl off and, and he's totally normal. And then he's got the cowl on. And I'm like, man, it's still your voice. <laughs> yeah. He kind of did have a, a dark, a raspy voice going for the entire film. I, <laughs> you know, it's not Christian Bale. So I'm not yeah. going to attack that at all. That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Um, no, nah, man. Like, Great stuff. Uh, a lot of grappling hook action. There was some real like brute force, you know, with with the uh, with the parademons that he was going after. Um, it was just really, I got I got nothing but good things to say about it. You know, like like that is why we go to the movies. Mm. Now, did I don't know if anyone caught what I posted. I don't think I posted it on our Instagram. Posted it on my personal page. That giant tank. That oh, he, yes. he stands on. It's all it's all over the it's on the internet with him on top of that thing. Does anybody know what that is? Mm, I definitely do not. I was uh, w- w- when I saw that scene, I remember seeing it on the internet and being like, "Wait a minute, this wasn't in the movie like basically at all." And where it comes up, you don't expect it to, and it there's no context surrounding it. So you're just like, "All right, cool, I guess." I think it was a throwaway, like a, a nod to the hardcore fan. So what that was, and for me personally, it was kind of a geek out moment because I read this comic book. And I'm sure everyone that read this comic book also um, appreciated this. That is the Batmobile from The Dark Knight Returns, which is this ginormous tank that he uses That's to, co- right. to combat the uh, this gang called the Mutants. It's the first thing that he uses when he comes out of retirement, I think after 10 years, like eight or 10 years. And it was like a cool feel good moment. It was like a, it was a good throwback. Like, ah, I remember that thing. That's what it looks like in real life. That's cool. Wow. So that to me, that was pretty fun. And that shows that Zack Snyder listens to his fans. That shows that he knows what he's doing and that he's not just doing it for the sake of a couple of bucks in his pocket. He, he cares. Man, man. Uh, all I got to say is Robert Pattinson has a lot to live up to. He does. And I think they just finished wrapping a couple of weeks ago. They did. Um, they, was... they, they, they they finished wrapping like the day after we recorded our podcast, I think. Or like, you know, two or three It was days very recent. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Let me ask you this question. Do you think that – he is going to live up to the the Hall of Cows with Affleck and Bale and Keaton. I mean, we've seen very limited footage. Uh, we've had the one, basically, the, the one trailer so far with footage that was maybe only 20% complete. So all that being said, what we did see was pretty, pretty compelling stuff. Um, and in those few short seconds of the trailer with Robert Pattinson's The Batman, we did see some nice brawler style fisticuffs happening. So bringing back that style, you know, is it intentional? Is it, you know, a subversion? It, you know, is this um, like we know that Robert Pattinson is going to be taking on this role as like a year one, year two Batman. So he's just getting his feet wet. You know, he's not a slick um, precise, agile fighter. It's going to be more like, you know, a lot of elbows getting thrown, a lot of knees getting thrown. You know, hitting the hard spots. You know, and 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 getting into these fights and walking away with all these bruises. So, the fighting style will be interesting to see. And 
I, I'm you know with, with with many things that now have Warner Brothers DC EU attached to it. I am now cautiously optimistic. You know, like they they, they don't exactly have a lot of hits in their bag. I can't go to a movie and be like, yes, I know for a fact this is going to be good because of the studio behind it. That is not a given with Warner Brothers. So, you know, uh, we, we discussed this on our last episode, uh, the cape and cowl on the silver screen. And, you know, folks, you can hear a great big breakdown as to how we feel about the movie verse. But, yeah, I'm cautiously optimistic. I hope so, too. I mean, I... I try not to read the dirt sheets. I try not to read what's going on and what's real and what's not real. You hear things like, oh, Robert Pattinson and um, and Matt Reeves having some issues that they can't work together, that this is going to be a one-and-done type movie as opposed to a trilogy that was supposed to come out out mm-hmm. of this. I hope all of that is bogus and that we actually do get a legitimate trilogy because I would love to see a lot. Of, there's a lot of content out there that hasn't been explored of yet course. in the – in the cinematic world, you know, we got the court of Owls that I still want to explore. We got hush. We got red hood. Hopefully any of these things, either Pattinson or Affleck's Batman taps into in the next couple mm. of years, but there's just so much material out there. And I kind of hope that Pattinson takes some of it. I want to see people thrive in this. I don't want to see failure. I didn't want to see Clooney failed, <laughs> but I want, I want to see all these guys rise up to the, to the challenge of course of course you know like and and i don't think fans of of any of these universes want these people to fail you know they they want them to succeed they want them to take these these icons of of comics and books and tv all the way into films animated it doesn't matter they want to see their icons come to life so why would you want them to fail? You know, like, like I, I, I'll never understand. You know, some people on the internet when it's like, oh no, this is gonna suck. Fuck it, I'm not gonna watch that. It's gonna be garbage. And then they just, you know, pout off into the sunset, and then they're gonna go watch it and spend their money on it anyway. Problem is, also goes back to nostalgia. They say that, and then they want to go back to something that is familiar to them. Like, uh, and I'm not dig- digging on this one at all, but Michael Keaton. You know, I love Michael Keaton's Batman, oh, of course. but, you know, people are saying, you know, oh, Pattinson's going to suck. Let's just keep Michael Keaton. Like, well, yeah, but dude, Michael Keaton's kind of up there in age. Yeah. He, can't be, he can't be doing it forever. So, I mean, for a nostalgic purpose, sure. But, you know, we got to give other guys a chance. I want to see Robert Pattinson succeed. You know, take away his Twilight era. You know, so what if he did that? I didn't like it, but you know what? I like what he's going to provide to this. At least I hope I'm going to like it. From like that two minute trailer we saw, it was very, very, very grounded, yes. very dark, very dark. So I want to see how this is going to go. This is probably the darkest Batman we've ever seen, and that's beyond my expectations. And I expected pretty dark stuff coming from the Cape Crusader. So to see Robert Pattinson go, you know, <laughs> hold my coffee and just pretty much <laughs> go even darker with this, I'm like, <laughs> do tell, and we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I do hope they lean into the detective side a little bit. Like he's, you know, like Batman isn't just a fighter. He's not just a brawler. Like he is smart. You know, he 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 he's literally a detective. So let's see some of that. Let's see some of that gumshoe film noir work. You know, I think that's and what I, the, you know. We I might think that's what we're gonna. That. I think I'm hoping so, especially with the villain being the Riddler. I would hope he's using his brains more than his brawn in this one. Not that I don't want to yeah. see fighting in this movie, but I definitely want to see some detective skills in this version. That's a given. That's a given. Um, yeah, man, Snyder cut. You know, spoiler free review here. I, uh, I thought it was great. I, I recommend it. Yes, it's a long watch. It is a good movie. Um, for me, I'm gonna go seven out of ten. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I put, like I said, I put mine on a high scale because, you know, I'm also following it compared to uh, what we got four years ago. And had that movie not existed, maybe the scale would be a little bit lower. But at the same time, I'm also a bit of a Snyder nut lately with all his content with. uh, You're in the world. Uh, I'm in it. Yeah. And, you know, he gave me the Batfleck or the Batfleck. He gave me the Batman that I wanted out of Affleck. So. You know, like I'm kind of biased now. He gave me what I wanted, so give me more. (laughs) So hopefully, (laughs) 
Oh my and, god! And I, he did a fantastic job. You know, I can't say enough. I already saw it twice in less than twenty four hours. So wow. I mean, will I see it again? Hell yeah, I'm going to see it again. Not anytime soon because this guy wants some motherfucking sleep. But I definitely <laughs> want to go see it again. And I hope, I hope, I hope everyone out there sees it. Also, put in the hashtag Restore the Snyderverse because we want more content. We want a Justice League 2. We want a Justice League 3. And for the love of God, what happens? What happens? And there's something else I want to bring up uh, as a result of Zack Snyder's Justice League. Uh, for all intents and purposes, it looks like it's a sex, uh, blah, 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 a success. It's getting good reviews online. Critics are happy. You know, like th- the big complaints, it's four hours long. Some of the CGI, yeah. blah, 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 blah. You know, all that stuff, you know, notwithstanding. Um, but I think this bodes well for directors to put out their own versions to go to HBO and be like, Hey, HBO. Uh, yeah, you remember my big blockbuster hit from a few years back? Well, I, I, I have a cut of it for myself that I, that I always wanted to do that never got released in theaters. Would you like to buy it? So who knows? Maybe we'll get more director's cuts of, you know, different movies. Maybe there will be, you know, a, a brand new cut of Man of Steel coming out later. Maybe there'll be a brand new cut of, um, you know, director's edition, Infinity War and Endgame. You know, like, who knows? I think this has opened a door that heretofore was unthought of. Well, there's definitely uh, room to discuss this. Uh, There is talk of the Schumacher cut of Batman Forever. There's talks of the (laughs) David Ayer's cut of Suicide Squad. You get that look all you want. You just said maybe there's more out there. Well, there is more out there, Mike. I guess. guess You you may not have wanted it. Exactly. You may not have wanted it, but it's there. Oh, shit. Whether, but I highly doubt that's going to come out. I highly doubt that David Ayer's uh, cut of Suicide Squad is going to come out. But. You know, maybe, like you said, maybe we'll get more out there. I don't think uh, we'll get more Man of Steel content by any means. I think yeah, we got, I, I think, using that as an example. I think, yeah, I think Nolan bled out as much as he could out of that movie. And that's a good thing because – or not Nolan, I'm sorry, Snyder. Snyder, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, man. So so what can we expect in future podcast episodes? What, what, what are we going to talk about in a couple of weeks? Because we've pretty much exhausted this. I mean, oh, yeah, we're, you know. we wrapped up this era, this uh, chapter for <laughs> the DCEU, at least for now. Uh, there was a few things that I had on my list. Uh, I definitely want to talk comics a little bit we had discussed some of our favorite comics earlier you know mine being batman versus predator uh yours being uh court of owls you mentioned and uh uh noel Mm -hmm. uh so so i definitely want to dive into some of those um and uh and we got to talk some of like the origins too because not everybody knows the very controversial beginnings of the batman well i mean I would hope that people do know the origin to an extent. I mean, it's been done at least, what, three times on theaters? No, no, no. I mean, like, the actual, the written story. You know, like, who created the Batman? Who oh, you, you mean, like, the legitimate origin? Yeah. Of, like, I mean, we can definitely dive into that. Actually, that is a very good topic we could discuss because a lot of people give one guy one credit when in reality it's a duel. Credit. Exactly. So I am exactly. all for an episode on that. Yeah, oh, man. What was it? Oh my god! I was just shame on me for not putting down notes, and I'm that's just not a good thing of mine. I had <laughs> other ideas I wanted to talk about regarding like the the first four Batman movies. We can definitely do reviews on like one movie each. I don't know. I don't know. I think sky's the limit, and uh, listeners, if you have something specific you want to hear us chat about, hit us up on Twitter or Instagram. Our handle is at Gotham U Pod, uh, Gotham University Podcast, a podcast all about Batman. 
Oh, man. But, uh, yeah, dude, we got to jump into some of these comics. I'd love to talk about Bob Kane a little bit. Yes. Um, th- there's there's a lot of interesting story and lore that goes into the Batman creators and, and how he first appeared in comics. And uh, I think I think all this stuff is really interesting, right? Like, yeah, you know, th- There's something to be said about comics and graphic novels and how they feed into our pop culture. Especially today, it's never been more relevant. We have we have an influx of comic book movies currently everywhere, all around us. And it's the new it's thing now. Else. Yeah, and uh, when we release this episode, I'm going to post the uh, there's a documentary out that dives into uh, Bob Kane and Bill Finger and the controversy oh, wow. behind. It's a fantastic documentary if you want to like, actually dive into the whole background of who created Batman and why Bill Ooh. Finger was kind of. Uh, ostracized from it and you know what really happened to him he got vindication i mean spoiler alert but i mean you, you kind of already knew that if you watched batman sure. v superman because his name was on the credits yeah. but he definitely got his family i should say got vindication over his name being on the credits oh, and rightfully good. so but uh fantastic documentary i'll post it up when we uh release this episode too very cool very cool all right brother man you want to uh take us out Sure. Guys, thank you for putting up with me today. I am going to go to bed as soon as I hit stop on this show. Uh, Thank you guys for listening. Tell your friends, tell your family, like, subscribe, share, do what you got to do to listen. If you are already listening, thank you so much. Find us, like Mikey said, on Gotham Upod. That's our Twitter and Instagram handle. Uh... We are on a lot of platforms, so don't be shy to find us on whatever you listen to as is. And anything else? That just about covers it, man. I just wanted to say thank you and uh, hope you all enjoy the Snyder Cut. Yes, enjoy it, watch it, spend a weekend watching it. You will not regret it. Hashtag Restore the Snyderverse. Hashtag Restore the Snyderverse. And if you've got comments that you want to have shared, uh, feel free to drop them on our Twitters or Instagrams. Or wherever. I don't know. Text me. Elsewhere on We Made This. Podcast 616. A Marvel Cinematic Universe podcast. I don't think an episode will end with, my name is Agatha Harkness, and we're supposed to be like, oh my god. Because if you haven't read anything outside the films, you'll be like, who the hell is that? It's like in that film I constantly like to give a kick in, in Star Trek Into Darkness, (laughs) where Cumberbatch goes, my name is Khan and then there's a pause. Yeah. And I imagine at least half the audience are going to be watching it and be like, who the hell is Khan? I have <laughs> yeah. no idea who this is. So if, if they try and pull that with Agatha Harkness, which I don't think they will, it will get the same reaction. Pick a disc. It, it's, uh, it definitely fits like a... I think there's always... I think this is a danger zone for a few in a few ways for Teen Girl where we try to write songs that sound like a a band from the 90s that we like and this one is just like it was it was our attempt at like kind of a slacker rock thing and i still like it but i don't think it ever fit with us live it never quite hit the right vibe live i still like it on the album but yeah that was i mean that one's you know uh that was a lot of fun because we brought in um our buddy alex to play guitar on the uh on like the the noise part in the middle which I really loved. And he actually did some really cool slide guitar for Snow Cones that we just, we, we, we kept off because we liked it as a simpler song. The time is now. A Millennium Podcast. And I do like that this is thrown in for something that is quite millenniumistic. Um, I, I refrain from, uh, uh, from saying sorry. that before I said it. <laughs> but I was like, I'll let you go. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. Yeah. Um, but but I think it also, it fits well um, uh, with the, the whole Y2K element. So you know, literally entering a dark age so if if all our technology were to fail today you can see given how how much data is is uh how much of all the data that sums up who we are and, and the age that we're living through is held digitally yeah it would lead to a dark age so i think i think it's very effective um to um to talk about the dark ages and, and introduce a text like that in the context of this episode check out all of these shows and more on the we made this podcast network